Chapter 13, Parts 1 and 2 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Surrett. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 13. The Revival of Athens and Her Second League. Part 1. High-Handed Policy of Sparta. The gates of the Peloponnesus were again open to Sparta without dispute. She was supported by Persia, and she had no complications in Asia to divide her energy. Accordingly, she was able to renew the despotic policy which had been inaugurated for her by Lysander. Arcadian Mantinea was the first to suffer. The Mantineans were accused of various acts of disobedience and disloyalty to Sparta, and commanded to pull down their walls. When they refused, King Agesipolis, son of the exiled Pausanias, marched out against them. The city of Mantinea stood in a high plain without any natural defences, depending entirely on its walls of unburnt brick. The river Ophis flowed through the town and a blockade proving tedious, Agesipolis dammed the stream at the point of issue. The water rose and undermined the walls, and when one of the towers threatened to fall, the people surrendered. Their punishment was severe. Mantinea ceased to be a city, and was broken up into its five constituent villages. Those who originally belonged to the village of Mantinea remained on the site of the city. The rest had to pull down their houses and move each to the village where his property was. The loss of civic life meant to a Greek the loss of all his higher interests. Agisilus, who had once gone forth to destroy the Persian power, zealously supported the king's peace. When someone suggested that it was at least curious to find the Spartans medizing, he rejoined, Rather say that the Persians are lassonizing. Each way of putting it expressed a measure of the truth, but some of the Lacedaemonians, including the king Agesipolis, were opposed to the recent policy of their government, and thought it ill done to abandon the Greeks of Asia. Some years after the peace, there seems to have been floating in the air a vague idea, which might or might not take shape, of organizing another Asiatic expedition. It was to animate this idea that the Athenian orator Isocrates published a festal speech when the Greek nation was assembled at the Olympian festival. He advocated a grand Panhellenic union against Persia, under the common headship of Sparta and Athens, Sparta taking the command by land, Athens by sea. It was the third occasion on which a renowned master of style had broached the same idea at the same gathering place. Nearly thirty years ago it had been recommended by the florid eloquence of Gorgias. More recently it had been advocated with gracious simplicity by Lysias and now the rich periods of Isocrates urged it once more upon Greece. The project, in the ideal form in which Isocrates imagined it, was at this moment chimerical. A hundred years before it had been hard enough to compass a practical cooperation between Greek powers of equal strength and pretensions in a war of defense. It was hopeless to think of such cooperation now for a war of aggression. Sparta and Athens were quarreling, as the orator complains, over the tribute of the Cyclid Islands, and neither was likely to yield to the other without a clear award of war, and other troubles were brewing in another quarter. The contest of East and West had been going on, meanwhile, in Cyprus, an island whose geographical situation marked it out, like Sicily, to be a meeting place of races. We have already met a man who played an eminent part in that struggle, Evagoras, the Prince of Salome. He belonged to the Teucrid family which had reigned there in the days of Darius and Xerxes, but had been supplanted by a Phoenician dynasty about the middle of the fifth century. Evagoras, crossing over from the Cilician Soli, won back the scepter of his race by a daring surprise. He governed with conspicuous moderation, discretion, and success, setting himself to the work of reviving the cause of Hellenism, which had lost much ground during the past half-century, and pursuing this task by entirely peaceful means. After Aegis Potami, the city of Evagoras became the refuge for large numbers of Athenians who had settled down in various parts of the Athenian Empire, and could no longer remain securely in their homes. 
for the first sixteen years of his reign, Evagoras was a faithful tributary of the great king, and we have seen how his influence at Susa assisted Conan. But soon after the Battle of Nidus he became involved in war, both with Persia and with some of the Phoenician cities in the island. The peace expressly recognized the sovereignty of Artaxerxes over Cyprus, and as soon as it was concluded Persia began to concentrate her forces against Evagoras and a recalcitrant king of Egypt, with whom Evagoras was leagued. A severe defeat at sea shut Evagoras up in Salome, but he held out so dauntlessly, and the war had already cost Persia so much, that Tiribazus agreed to leave him his principality, on condition that he should pay tribute, as a slave to his lord. Evagoras refused. He would only pay it as one king to another. The negotiations were ruptured for a moment on this point of honor, but a dispute between a satrap and his subordinate general resulted in the removal of Tiribazus and his successor permitted Evagoras to have his way. The Salaminian despot had thus gained a moral triumph. He did not survive it many years, and the story of his death is curious. A certain man named Nicocrian formed a plot against his life, and being detected was forced to fly. He left a daughter behind him in Salome under the care of a faithful eunuch. This servant privily acquainted both Evagoras and his son Nitagoras with the existence of this young lady and her uncommon beauty and undertook to conduct them to her bedchamber, each without the knowledge of the other. Both kept the assignation and were slain by the eunuch, who thus avenged his master's exile. Another son of Evagoras, named Nicocles, succeeded him, and pursued the same Hellenizing policy. One of the great objects of these enlightened princes was to keep their country in touch with the intellectual and artistic movements of Greece. Nicocles was a student of Greek philosophy and a generous friend of the essayist Isocrates, to whose pen we are indebted for much of what we know of the career of Evagoras. Towards the close of the almost single-handed struggle of Salome against Persia, the eyes of Greece were directed to a different quarter of the world. Events were passing in the north of the Aegean, which riveted the attention of Sparta and Athens. Their Greek brethren of Cyprus and the Asiatic coast seemed to be quite forgotten, for while the Oriental question almost passes out of the pages of Greek history, Yet it was destined that from that very region on the northwest corner of the Aegean should issue the force which should not only reclaim for European influence Cyprus and all the Greek cities of Asia, but bear Greek light into lands of which Agesilus had never dreamed. That force was being forged in the Macedonian uplands, and some who were children when Isocrates published his panegyric against the barbarian lived to see the barbarian succumb to a Greek power. It was indeed only indirectly that the southern Greeks had now to concern themselves with their backward brethren of Macedonia. One of the chief obstacles to the development of this country was its constant exposure to the attacks of its Illyrian neighbors, and an Illyrian invasion supported by domestic disloyalty compelled King Amentus, he was the nephew of Perdiccas, to flee from his kingdom. Amentus, soon after his accession, had concluded a close defensive and commercial alliance for fifty years with the Chalcidian League, which had been formed by Olynthus and comprised the towns of the Sithonian promontory. It was, as we observed already, an age of small federations. At the moment of his retreat Amentus handed over to the Chalcidians the lower districts of Macedonia and the cities lying round the Thermaic Gulf. The Macedonian cities readily embraced an union which could protect them against the Illyrians and the league spread from the maritime towns up the country and included even Pella. Perfect equality and brotherhood between the members was the basis of this Chalcidian confederacy. All the cities had common laws, common rights of citizenship, intermarriage and commerce. Olynthus did not assume a privileged position for herself. The neighboring Greek cities were also asked to join, and some of them, Potidaea, for instance, accepted the offer. But it was always a sacrifice for a Greek city to give up its hereditary laws and surrender any part of its sovereignty, whatever compensating advantages might be purchased, and there was consequently more reluctance among the Chalcidians than among the less developed Macedonians to join the League. The Olynthians, as their work grew, conceived the idea of a confederate power which should embrace the whole Chalcidic peninsula and its neighborhood. Once this ambition took form, it became necessary to impose by force their proposition upon all those who declined to accept it freely. The strong cities of Acanthus and Apollonia resisted, and sent envoys to Sparta to obtain her help. Moreover, Amentus had recovered his throne, 
and when the Olynthians refused to abandon the cities which he had handed over to them, he too looked for aid to Sparta. These appeals directed the eyes of Greece upon the Chalcidian Confederacy. It was the Lacedaemonian policy to oppose all combinations and keep Greece disunited, a policy which was popular, in so far as it appealed to that innate love of autonomy which made it so difficult to bring about abiding federal unions in Greece. The ambassadors had little difficulty in persuading the Lacedaemonians and their allies that the movement in Chalcidice was dangerous to the interests of Sparta, and should be crushed at the outset, and they argued that the very liberality of the principles on which it was founded made the League more attractive and therefore more dangerous. A vote of assistance to Acanthus and Apollonia was passed, and a small advance force was immediately sent under Eudamidas. Though unable to meet the Confederate army in the field, this force was sufficient to protect the cities which had refused to join the League, and it even induced Patadaya to revolt. The expedition against the Chalcidian Confederacy led unexpectedly to an important incident elsewhere. Phoebidas, the brother of Eudamidas, was to follow with larger forces, and, as the line of march lay through Boeotia, a party in Thebes favorable to Sparta thought to profit by the proximity of Spartan troops for the purpose of a revolution. The Antiotus, the most prominent member of this party, was then one of the Polemarchs. He concerted with Phoebidus a plot to seize the Cadmia, the citadel of Thebes, on the day of the Themisphoria, for on that day the citadel was given up to the use of the women who celebrated the feast. The plot succeeded perfectly. The Acropolis was occupied without striking a blow. The oligarchical council was intimidated by Leontiadus, and his colleague, the other Polemarch, Ismenius, was arrested. The leading anti-Spartans fled from Thebes, and a government friendly to Sparta was established. This was a great triumph for Sparta, a great satisfaction to Agisilus, although, as a violation of peace, it caused a moment's embarrassment. Was the government to recognize the action of Phoebidus and profit by it? Spartan hypocrisy compromised the matter. Phoebidus was fined one hundred thousand drachma for his indiscretion, and the Cadmia was retained. Then Ismenius was tried by a body of judges representing Sparta and her allies, and was condemned on charges of Medism and executed. That Sparta, after the king's peace, should condemn a Theban for Medism was a travesty of justice. With the fortress of Thebes in her hands, Sparta had a basis for extending her power in central Greece, and might regard her supremacy as secured. She restored the city of Plataea, which she had herself destroyed well nigh fifty years agone, and gathered all the Plataeans who could be found to their old home. But her immediate attention was fixed on the necessity of repressing the dangerous league in the north of Greece, and continuing the measures which had been interrupted by the enterprise of Phoebidus in Boeotia. The popular brother of Agisilus, to Lucius, was sent to conduct the war. But although he was aided by Amentus, and by Derdas, a prince of Upper Macedonia, who supplied good cavalry, it proved no easy matter to make head against the League. In front of the walls of Olynthus, to Lucius sustained a signal defeat and was himself slain. The war was fatal to a king as well as to a king's brother. Agisipolis, who was next sent out at the head of a very large force, caught a fever in the intolerable summer heat. He was carried to the shady grove of the temple of Dionysus at Aphitus, and he died there, and his body, stowed in honey, was brought home for burial. His successor, Polybiatus, was more successful. He forced the Olynthians to sue for peace and dissolve their league. They and all the Greek cities of the peninsula were constrained to join the Lacedaemonian alliance, and the maritime cities of Macedonia were restored to the sway of Amentus. Thus Sparta put down an attempt to overcome that system of isolation which placed Greek cities at a great disadvantage when they had barbarian neighbors. If Sparta had not happened to be so strong at this moment, the Chalcidian League might have grown into a power which would have considerably modified the development of Macedonia. All that Sparta did, although for a moment it made her power paramount in northern Greece, fell out ultimately to the advancement and profit of Macedon. About the same time, the Lacedaemonians were making their heavy hand felt in the Peloponnesus. Soon after the king's peace they had forced the Phliasians to recall a number of banished aristocrats. Disputes arose about the restoration of confiscated property, and the exiles appealed to Sparta, where they had a zealous supporter in Agisilus. War was declared. Agisilus reduced the city of Phlius by blockade, and compelled it to receive a Lacedaemonian garrison for six months, 
until a commission of one hundred, which he nominated, should have drawn up a new constitution. Thus the Lacedaemonians, in alliance with the tyrant Dionysius and the barbarian Artaxerxes, tyrannized over the Greeks for a space. Some demonstrations were made, some voices of protest were raised, in the name of the Panhellenic cause. At the Olympian festival, which was held about two years after the king's peace, the Athenian orator Lysias warned the assembled Greeks of the dangers which loomed in the east and in the west from Persia and from Sicily, and uttered his amazement at the policy of Lacedaemon. A magnificent deputation had been sent by Dionysius to this festival, and the inflammatory words, perhaps the direct instigation of the speaker, incited some enthusiastic spectators to attack the gorgeous pavilion of the Syracusan envoys. The outrage was prevented, but the occurrence shows the beginning of that tide of feeling to which Isocrates appealed four years later, when in his festal oration he denounced the Lacedaemonians as sacrificing the freedom of Greece to their own interests and treacherously aiding foreigners and tyrants. Even Xenophon, the friend of Sparta's king, the admirer of Sparta's institutions, is roused to regretful indignation at Sparta's conduct, and recognizes her fall as a just retribution. The Lacedaemonians, who swore to leave the cities independent, seized the Acropolis of Thebes, and they were punished by the very men, single-handed, whom they had wronged, though never before had they been vanquished by any single people. It is a proof that the gods observe men who do irreligious and unhallowed deeds. In this way the pious historian introduces the event which prepared the fall of Sparta and the rise of Thebes. Section 2. Alliance of Athens and Thebes The government of Leontiadus and his party at Thebes, maintained by fifteen hundred Lacedaemonians in the citadel, was despotic and cruel like that of the thirty at Athens. Fear made the rulers suspicious and oppressive for they were afraid of the large number of exiles who had found a refuge at Athens and were awaiting an opportunity to recover their city. Athens was now showing the same goodwill to the fugitives from Thebes, which Thebes, when Athens was in a like plight, had shown to Thrasybulus and his followers. One of the exiles, named Polypidus, of more than common daring and devotion, resolved to take his life in his hands and found six others to associate in his plans. No open attack was to be thought of. Thebes must be recovered by guile, even as by guile it had been won. There were many in Thebes who were bitter foes of the ruling party, such as Epaminondas, the beloved friend of Pelopidas, but most of them deemed the time unripe for any sudden stroke for freedom. Yet a few were found ready to run the risk. Above all, Philidus, who was the secretary of the Polemarchs and therefore the most useful of confederates, and Charon, a citizen of good estate, who offered his house as a place of hiding for the conspirators. The day on which the two polemarchs, Archias and Philippus, were to go out of office was fixed for the enterprise. On the day before, Polypidus and his six comrades crossed Cathiron in the guise of huntsmen, and nearing Thebes at nightfall, mixed with the peasants who were returning from the fields, got them safely within the gates, and found safe hiding in the abode of Charon. The secretary, Philidus had made ready a great banquet for the following night, to which he had bidden the outgoing polemarchs, tempting them by the promise of introducing them to some high-born and beautiful women whose love they desired. During the caress a messenger came with a letter for Archias, and said that it concerned serious affairs. "'Business to-morrow,' said Archias, placing it under his pillow. On the morrow it was found that this letter disclosed the conspiracy. The polemarchs then called for the women, who were waiting in an adjoining room. Philidus said that they declined to appear till all the attendants were dismissed. When no one remained in the dining hall but the polemarchs and a few friends, all flushed with wine, the women entered and sat down beside the lords. They were covered with long veils, and even as they were bidden lift them and reveal their charms, they buried daggers in the bodies of the polemarchs, for they were none other than Polypidus and his fellows in the guise of women. Then they went and slew in their houses Leontiadus and Hippitus, the two other chief leaders of the party and set free the political prisoners. When all this was done, Epaminondas and the other patriots, who were unwilling to initiate such deeds themselves, accepted the revolution with joy. When the day dawned, an assembly of the people was held in the Agora, and the conspirators were crowned with wreaths. Three of them, including Polypidus, were appointed polemarchs, and a democratic constitution was established. The rest of the exiles and a body of Athenian volunteers presently arrived on the news of the success. 
The Spartan commander of Cadmia had sent hastily, on the first alarm, for reinforcements to Thespiae and Plataea, but those that came were charged and repelled outside the gate. Then in the first flush of success the patriots resolved to storm the Cadmia, strong as the place was, but the labor and danger were spared them. Amazing as it may seem, the Lacedaemonian harmists decided to capitulate at once. Two of these commanders were put to death on their return to Sparta, and the third was banished. The chagrin of the ephors and Agisilus was intense. King Cleombrotus was immediately sent with an army into Boeotia, but accomplished nothing. Athens was formerly at peace with Sparta, and was not disposed to break with her, however great may have been the secret joy felt at the event in Boeotia. But the march of the Athenian volunteers to Thebes was an awkward incident, the more so as there were two strategi among them. Lacedaemonian envoys arrived to demand explanation and satisfaction, and their statements were reinforced by the neighborhood of the army of King Cleombrotus. There is indeed nothing to be said for the conduct of the two strategi. They had abused their position and brought their city into danger and embarrassment. We can only approve the sentence of the Athenians, which executed one and banished the other. But if these Athenian generals were indiscreet, it was as nothing beside the indiscretion of a Lacedaemonian commander, which now precipitated the breach between the two states. A not ignoble sympathy might have been pleaded by the two Athenians, but no excuse could be urged for the rash enterprise of the Spartan harmist of Thespiae, who aspired to be a second Phoebidus. His name was Phodrius, and he conceived the plan of making a night march to Athens and surprising Piraeus on the land side. To seize Piraeus, the seat of Athenian merchandise, would be a compensation for the loss of Thebes. But the plan was, if not ill-considered, at least ill-carried out. Day dawned when he had hardly passed Eleusis, and there was nothing to do but turn back. He retreated, laying waste the districts through which he passed. Great wrath was kindled in Athens by this unprovoked deed of hostility. The envoys had not yet gone. They were immediately thrown into prison, but escaped by declaring that the Spartan government was not responsible for the raid, and would speedily prove its innocence by the condemnation of Sphodrius. The assurance was belied. Sphodrius was not condemned. His son and the son of Agisilus were lovers, and the king's influence saved him. Agisilus was reported to have said, Sphodrius is guilty, of course, but it is a hard thing to put to death a man who, as child, stripling, and man, lived a life of perfect honor. For Sparta needeth such soldiers. This miscarriage of justice was a grave mistake of policy and the high-handed insolence of the Spartan oligarchs was set in a more glaring light by contrast with the fair-mindedness which the Athenian people had displayed in promptly punishing its own generals for a similar, though certainly less heinous, act. The Athenian generals had at least not invaded Lacedaemonian territory. It was debated at the time, and has been debated since, whether Sphodrius acted wholly of his own accord. Some thought that the suggestion came from King Cleombrotus, and the theory was started that the Thebans were the prime instigators, an unlikely theory, which was evidently based on the fact that Thebes was the only gainer by the raid. It seems most probable that the private ambition of Sphodrius, who thought he had a chance of emulating Phoebidus, was alone responsible. The raid and acquittal of Sphodrius drove Athens, against her will, into war with Sparta and alliance with Thebes. It stirred her for a while to leave her role of neutral spectator and assume that of an active belligerent, for the next six years, Athens and Sparta are at war, though such a war was contrary to the interests of both states, but especially to the interests of Sparta. End of chapter 13, part 2 Recording by Phil Surrett, Ottawa, Ontario